Welcome back to everyone. We will now start our second panel in today's webinar. So by the second decade of Uzbekistan's independence, its bilateral relationship with the United States had matured significantly. The two countries had developed a relationship based on a broad set of mutual interests, including countering regional threats such as narco-terrorism, tra uh, narco-trafficking, terrorism, and violent extremism. Following the terrorist attacks on 9-11, Uzbekistan offered its support, leading to the Declaration on the Strategic Partnership and Cooperation Framework that U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell and Uzbekistan's Foreign Minister Abdulaziz Kamilov signed on March 12, 2002. For our next panel on advancing the strategic partnership between the United States and Uzbekistan, we are joined by three U.S. ambassadors who helped lead the bilateral relationship through a period of complex regional dynamics. Our first speaker is Ambassador John Herbst. Ambassador Herbst is the director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Ambassador Herbst served for 31 years as a foreign service officer in the Department of State, retiring at the rank of career minister. Ambassador Herbst served as the U.S. Ambassador to Uzbekistan from 2000 to 2003, before becoming the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine in 2003. Among his other postings, he served as U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem, Principal Deputy to the Ambassador at Large for the Newly Independent States, Director of the Office of Independent States and Commonwealth Affairs, Director of Regional Affairs in the Near East Bureau, and at the U.S. Embassies in Tel Aviv, Moscow, and Riyadh. Additionally, Ambassador Herp served as the Director of the Center for Complex Operations at the National Defense University. His writings on stability operations, Central Asia, Ukraine, and Russia are widely published. Also joining us today is Ambassador Richard Norland. Ambassador Norland has served as the U.S. Ambassador to Libya since August 2019. And in May, the Department of State announced his appointment to serve concurrently as the U.S. Special Envoy for Libya. A career diplomat, Ambassador Norland most recently served as the Foreign Policy Advisor to the former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford. Ambassador Norland served as the U.S. Ambassador to Uzbekistan from 2007 to 2010. Some of his other previous postings have included U.S. Ambassador to Georgia, Deputy Chief of Mission in Afghanistan, and Deputy Chief of Mission in Latvia. He has also served as the International Affairs Advisor and Deputy Commandant at the National War College at the National Defense University, Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council, and as a Senior Fellow at Georgetown University's Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. Rounding out this panel is Ambassador George Kroll. Ambassador Kroll joined the Foreign Service in 1982 and retired to Middletown, Rhode Island in 2018 after 36 years in the State Department. He served in Poland, India, Russia, and Ukraine, and as U.S. Ambassador to Belarus and Kazakhstan, in addition to his time as U.S. Ambassador to Uzbekistan from 2011 to 2014. Earlier in his career, Ambassador Kroll had also served as the Special Assistant to the Ambassador-at-Large for the newly independent states and visited Uzbekistan during this period, as well as Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs while Ambassador Norland was in Tashkent. Ambassador Kroll currently teaches an elective course on the former Soviet world as an adjunct professor at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island lectures and writes on Eurasian foreign policy and is an associate of Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. We'll begin with each ambassador providing opening remarks to set the stage for our discussion. I'll ask them some follow-up questions and we'll also take questions from the audience. Again, I would ask that the attendees please submit their questions at any time during the session. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Ambassador Herbst for his opening remarks. Thanks, thank you, Brian, for inviting me. And it's good to see George and Dick here as well. Um, I think I was very lucky to go to Uzbekistan in 2000. I had just come from being Consul General in Jerusalem, where I had about this much influence over American policy towards the Palestinians 
because of the very high political interest in the subject. And I got to Uzbekistan, and uh, this is not something that I think um, the Uzbeks appreciated at the time. Um, they received not much attention. I say they did understand they received not much attention from Washington. Uh, I was lucky too, because while today there's a tendency to deprecate um, President Karimov, I understood that on um, key foreign policy issues or some key foreign policy issues, he was actually very strong. Um, Uzbekistan shares the good fortune of not having a border with Russia. And that plus the great um, historic, I'd say, uh, achievement of the Uzbek people made them recognize and made Karimov as president recognize that he needed to keep Russia at a certain distance to ensure the independence of his country. And I appreciated that in him then and now. And I knew too, um, before I arrived in Tashkent, that we had a problem in Afghanistan called Osama bin Laden. And the one country in the region that was helping us deal with this problem was in fact Uzbekistan. And that made a very um, strong impression on me. Now I arrived in Tashkent in all, early October of 2000. And we didn't have really a single policy on Uzbekistan. We had three policies. Uh, one was the State Department policy, was to hector Uzbekistan for its human rights abuses. And those were real and those were serious. Then we had the Pentagon policy, which was rather favorably disposed towards Tashkent because Uzbekistan had clearly the most serious and capable military. And we worked well with them, the Pentagon worked well with them. And then we had the CIA, which loved Uzbekistan for reasons I've already suggested because they were helping us keep track on bin Laden in Afghanistan. And I saw my job in arriving was to make these three policies one. And I think I succeeded in that. And that's because unlike in Jerusalem where I had very, very little influence on US policy, in Tashkent I had a great deal of influence. And I set those markers out uh, in a very clear way, talking with all parts of the US government about how, for example, the, the CIA and the Pentagon could not ignore human rights as a problem. And the State Department had to acknowledge that Uzbekistan from a security point of view was important to the United States. And actually there's one more point that needs to be mentioned here, something which I believe um, my Uzbek host welcomed. While the Uzbeks had a serious human rights problem, it was not as nasty as portrayed in the Western media because um, some very clever fellow or lady, uh, either in the Uzbek opposition or in the Western human rights community, came up with a slogan um, designed to make Uzbekistan look as bad as possible in the human rights domain. Um, the phrase was peaceful Muslims. And they said the Uzbeks were cracking down on peaceful Muslims. And technically that was not false. But the reason why I say this was a clever, but not necessarily a um, objective description is something like 90%, over 90% of the human rights detainees in Uzbekistan were in fact affiliated, affiliated with Hizmet Takrir, an extremist Islamic organization, which however, at that time was not advocating violence. So to call them peaceful Muslims was not false, but it's clearly obscured who was in jail. And I made that point very clear publicly for early on, um, something which did not endear me to human rights organizations in the West that did, want, did not want this scam. Well, maybe they didn't understand it was a scam. Maybe they were simply ignorant, but didn't want that to be revealed. All this sets the stage for 9-11. So uh, I remember on September 10 of 2001, uh, hearing that the line of the Panjshir was assassinated. And I, in fact, I paid my respects on September 11 um, morning in Tashkent, still, um, in, still in the evening of September 10 in the United States uh, at the, at the uh, Af Afghan uh, office of the opposition in Tashkent. And then of course, 9-11 happened. And it was um, one of the most exciting parts of my career because I immediately understood 
that we had to go into Afghanistan. And I also understood that the place that could help us most easily and the most immediately was Uzbekistan. So I sent a um, email back to Beth Jones, who was then the Assistant Secretary for European Affairs, laying out how the Uzbeks could help us. And she said, great, John, um, please do me a favor, send me the cable you're gonna send in first so I can look at it. I said, okay. And so the day after um, we sent in the cable, laying out that in order to conduct a, a, an operation in Afghanistan, we needed a base. That base was not gonna be in Iran for obvious reasons. It was not gonna be in Pakistan for obvious reasons. It could not be in the ocean for obvious reasons. Turkmenistan and Tajikistan wouldn't quite do. The, the obvious place is Uzbekistan. And Washington liked that idea. Uh, I pointed out that there were two Uzbek concerns. One was our staying power, which of course is now a, um, a topical subject. The other was Russia. Uh, and it, it's worth discussing this for about 45 seconds. Uh, while Putin made a quick call to then President Bush to offer Russian support, both Russian uh, condolences for the attack and the casualties, but Russian support. And while publicly Putin spoke about his willingness to see a Uzbek, excuse me, Uzbek, US base in Central Asia, behind the scenes the Russians were working against it. And you had various senior Russian delegations arriving in Tashkent um, in the early fall, well, very, very late summer, right? September 11th, still summer. Very late summer and early fall of 2001, telling the Uzbeks it's not such a great idea, even as Putin was giving a public nod. Uh, but the Uzbeks saw um, a good play in this. They had always been looking for a much closer relationship with Washington. And this was obviously the way to get it. Um, I've made mistakes in my career, but I did not make a mistake here because I told the Uzbeks, I said, you know, we're going to be your best friend for the next six to 12 months. But if you want a good relationship with us for the long term, you're going to have to address issues that relate to, for example, most importantly, your human rights record, but also your general outlook towards reform. And we wound up um, negotiating and um, signing a memorandum of agreement. In fact, Dick Hogan was then the director of the Central Asian Desk, and he played a major positive role in that, um, which laid out all the things Uzbekistan should do um, to have a better relationship with Washington. And that became our, those two things became our relationship for the remainder of my time in Tashkent, and I left in July of 2003. One, their support for us as we conducted the operation in Afghanistan. And again, that was absolutely essential. We could not begin operations until we had agreed on the base in Uzbekistan, until we had air assets there that could um, would be able to rescue American pilots if they were shot down while conducting operations over the Taliban Afghanistan. Uh, and working on that memorandum of agreement. And I can tell you, if you go back and look at it, it was a fairly, it was recognizing uh, the state of Uzbekistan, recognizing that you cannot have immediate progress, uh, or rather substantial immediate progress. It was a rather ambitious document in terms of talking about um, easing government control in the economy, um, again, stopping uh, human rights abuses, reducing the number of human rights detainees. And we achieved some things in, as we moved that document. For example, we got the UN torture rapporteur into the country. He went to, to see Joslik, the most infamous prison in Uzbekistan, where most infamously a prisoner was boiled to death, uh, I believe it was in the summer of 2002, truly dreadful. Uh, and some steps were taken in the right direction in a host of areas. But what we learned, and I think what Karimov learned, was that he didn't have full control over the political system. And there was substantial pushback across all areas where we tried to make progress on our reform agenda. And uh, Karimov, I think, understood that he, only, he was unable to move um, at least some vested interest on some of those issues. And of course, I'm not sure he was all that enthusiastic about some of the things we we're asking him to do. And that thing kind of stalled. And that set the stage for the deteriorations in relation, the relationship which followed um, over the following several years. But that, the beginning of that deterioration probably came in my last five, six months 
And there are some amusing stories I could tell, but I would be described be revealing um, sources that I should not want to reveal uh, some of the more comic aspects of that. So uh, I probably shouldn't even have mentioned that, but the point is I understood that on my way out. Uh, I should add one more thing though, that's really important. I'm um, speaking to the way the United States conducts statecraft overseas. There was an issue that um, I would say partly also contributed to the deteriorating relationship, which should never have arisen. Uh, the Uzbeks, when they made the deal with us, took the high road. When I say the deal, I'm talking about the deal on the basis. And they weren't looking for big bucks. And they, they explicitly said that. What they wanted was the geopolitical payoff of the strong relationship with the United States. And they did that despite you know, the obvious problems with corruption in Uzbekistan. So that was great for us, right? Uh, but of course, we, we, we said we would pay for legitimate expenses that arose. And the Uzbeks began to compile those expenses. And because, you know, the, once we got the key decision on the base, you know, and Rumsfeld came out here to do this, Tommy Franks, who was then the head of um, CENTCOM, came out to get, the, to get the deal done. John Bolton came out from state to start that process. Once we got that, the Uzbek relationship really was turned over to the Munchkins. And in this case, to the green eye shade guys at the Pentagon, who said, well, if you want to be reimbursed, you have to fill out Form Z and Q. And as a result, we didn't pay the maybe few millions of dollars of completely legitimate expenses. And this was an irritant which we did not need in the relationship. And I'm not gonna say that this would have prevented the deterioration, though the deterioration came over the big stuff. But it was something that was, I think, disrespectful to them, and we should learn to do this better. So that was my time in Uzbekistan. It was, I had a great time. The um, geopolitical events turned it into a really, really interesting and high pressure job. I had one congressman visit in my first year in Tashkent. The second year, we had almost the, we had like um, 80 senators and not quite as many Congress folk. And that was great too, to, to um, teach them about what's going on in Uzbekistan, including on the human rights issue, where I had senators um, repeating my analysis, not which did not please some of those human rights organizations, but it sure pleased the hell out of me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Herbst. And we'll go now to Ambassador Norland for his remarks. Hey, thanks very much, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming through crystal clear. Great. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, congratulations to you and to Ambassador Bahabo for organizing this and thanks for inviting me. And it's a treat to be uh, here with John and uh, George, great colleagues and friends. Uh, uh, and I'm also conscious that John Purnell, who was the ambassador immediately prior to my being there, was not able to make this today. But, um, you know, I think this should all be a, a tribute to him as well. Um, just a few points, uh, and then we can go into, we can drill down in, in, the, in the discussion. But um, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I, I got to Uzbekistan from Afghanistan. Uh, so I'd had a, a chance to see, you know, what that relationship looked like uh, to the north of Afghanistan and, and already have a feel for how important it was. And, you know, the, the first thing that struck me was I, I thought I'd really uh, uh, struck gold in a way, because clearly I was in a country that in many ways is the most important country in the region. Uh, it's kind of a linchpin, a center of gravity. It had the largest population. Uh, and, and you just felt like you had landed someplace that had real strategic importance, um, as well as a, a very a dynamic young population, uh, very well disposed to the United States at, at a time when you know, many people might have felt that, the, that, you know, much in the Muslim world didn't like the United States or hated the United States. Um, here you had an overwhelmingly Muslim population that was very favorably disposed towards the United States. Um, uh, and never mind the, the, the incredible history, the rich culture of, of uh, Uzbekistan, the physical beauty, and just to be able to go to some truly exotic places like Samarkand and Bukhara and um, you know, or the, uh, the, see the, the petroglyphs at Sarmish Gorge, uh, things that you just are never going to see anywhere else in your life. Um, John has touched on, on the strategic importance of Uzbekistan. Um, and, uh, you know, with the Afghan wars, uh, gathering momentum, that, uh, 
that em- that aspect of things was emphasized um, consistently and, and uh, all the more. Uh, maybe one way that that really manifested itself was um, uh, in the issue on the issue of transporting materiel into Afghanistan. As pressure came on the the southern lines of communication through Pakistan, uh, it became increasingly clear that uh, bringing supplies in through the north uh, using the old the Soviet era rail lines. Um, was was not only viable but uh, essential, and um, and so you know the idea was you you'd offload cargo in the Baltic ports, put it on on uh, trains that would go through Russia and Kazakhstan and to Uzbekistan down to Termez. Uh, I think sometime after I left, the the Uzbeks actually completed a rail line from Termez to Mazari Sharif, and this this was a a very important thing, not so much for shipping in weapons or ammunition, but for a lot of the basic uh, supplies that, that uh, military bases need, food, uh, uh, cement, uh, construction materials. But, uh, you know, what, it was sufficiently important that, you know, General Petraeus came a couple of times to, uh, to work this issue uh, with the Uzbek authorities. And, um, and we were pleased that uh, we were able to, to reach an agreement with the Uzbeks to, to establish the Northern, Northern Distribution Network. Um, and I'll, I'll touch in a second on how that did, of course, uh, butt up against our, our human rights uh, uh, policies and goals. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, that's really one of the maybe one of the main themes that comes across when you talk about Uzbekistan. But on the strategic side still, just to also, you know, we realize that um, Uzbekistan is in, uh, in the backyard of, of China um, and it's not far from Russia. Uh, It's a country, along with the other countries in in Central Asia, that uh, having established its independence was very eager to maintain that independence and sovereignty and felt very much under pressure from the Russians uh, and increasingly from the Chinese as the Chinese started to push their their own new Silk Road concept and uh, Belt and Road concept. And, um, you know, my feeling was always that uh, as we, you know, the U.S. was often talking about the pivot to Asia, we're talking again about the pivot to Asia, but it's important to remember that China has two, two flanks, you know, and it's not just the maritime flank in the east, but there's a flank in the west that, uh, that con- consists of countries that want to maintain their independence and sovereignty and want to partner with us and with Europe and with anybody who will support them on that. And so I think we had a chance to to uh, begin to understand that dimension uh, and maybe a little bit as, as John says, you know, uh, it, it, w- there was a lag factor before Washington would completely seize on that. I, I think, um, you know, uh, f- from my perspective, it's, it's something that uh, mattered then, it matters now. And, and, you know, as we talk about drawing down in Afghanistan, we still need to remember that part of the world is really important if we're going to have a, a, a comprehensive China policy. And so I think it's wise to, to engage with Uzbekistan in that respect. Uh, and then finally, let me just talk again, uh, as John talked about a bit on, on the human rights front. Uh, you know, we, there was always, in a sense, it's like this classic uh, juxtaposition in, in, in policymaking between your, your uh, alleged strategic interests and your, your alleged human rights interests. And as if these are necessarily in conflict. And of course, what you're trying to do is, is align them as much as possible uh, to try to persuade partners that actually it's in their long-term interest to to have a, a more open and democratic society, um, but also to, to persuade, uh, you know, those who are very focused on human rights issues that, um, you know, if, if you ignore strategic interests, uh, that's going to have human rights uh, effects as well. Um, there was certainly a climate of fear in Tashkent when we got there uh, and for much of our time. I, I think uh, it clearly had the trappings of a dictatorship, um, you know, but um, there was also a, a genuine concern and a valid concern about extremists and terrorists uh, doing bad things. Uh, I think the very first walk up suicide bombing at any U.S. embassy in the world happened in Tashkent. And um, so, you know, these, these were issues that we talked about with the president and, and with others. Um, and I think the, for me, the takeaway was uh, something that another diplomatic colleague uh, uh, said, you know, in, in Tashkent, uh, it's engagement, engagement, engagement. You know, we can sit uh, and, and uh, pound the podium and tell people what they should do or threaten sanctions. But uh, in Uzbekistan's case, the, the, the best way to make real progress was through quiet diplomacy. Uh, that doesn't mean we ignored our principles. Uh, it doesn't mean we even stopped espousing our principles from the podium. But on specific issues, 
the best way to make progress was kind of behind the scenes. And for me, one of the good examples of that was uh, the case of Sandra Rumarov, who had been detained, um, allegedly, you know, conspiring against the government. Um, his family approached us at one stage and said he, they understood he was in very poor health. Uh, we made an appeal to the president on humanitarian grounds and uh, uh, Umarov was released and I, I think uh, lives in Tennessee now. Um, and um, so I think that it's possible to make progress on these things. Uh, but um, the bottom line for me is Uzbekistan was a fascinating experience, a really interesting and beautiful part of the world uh, that needs to be uh, understood and appreciated more. And I'm glad you're holding this session uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Norland. Uh, we'll go now to Ambassador Kroll for his remarks. And as a reminder to all of our attendees, you can submit your questions for all the ambassadors at any time. So Ambassador Kroll to you. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, could I just confirm you can all hear me? Good. Yes, thank we you. can hear you. Right. And uh, again, thank you for inviting me to uh, join my colleagues. I listened into the uh, previous session uh, and this session, it's good to see that lots of people that I knew uh, back in the day, uh, including in, uh, in Uzbekistan and uh, the likes. So nice to see Dick and, and John. I saw you yesterday. But <laughs> the, the virtual world is, uh, is amazing, isn't it? Um, but um, getting to the subject uh, of my experience in Uzbekistan, but as you noted in my biography that uh, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Central Asian Affairs uh, before I, I, I went to Uzbekistan. So Dick knows me quite well because uh, he and I, I was on the Washington side and he was on the Tashkent side as we had to deal with many of these things that Dick had mentioned. Uh, I would say that it, it is unfortunate that we don't have uh, Ambassador Purnell here because that lacuna of what happened in the period after John Herbst and when Dick Norling gave, there was of course a critical moment in the history of the relations, unfortunately of where the bottom fell out of the relationship and the attempt of trying to build that relationship up again between the governments, uh, which had seriously deteriorated after the, uh, the, the, the response to the Andijan events. And I know that uh, uh, Dick Norland uh, spent an awful lot of effort to reestablish a form of dialogue and discussion with the, uh, the Uzbek uh, government leadership, in particular with President Karimov, uh, which had uh, basically, uh, uh, was almost non-existent uh, before uh, Dick arrived, if I'm correct. So the effort was how to reestablish these ties because in Washington, what I had to deal with and what Dick had to deal with out in the field was, and as John has mentioned uh, uh, in, his, in, uh, um, in earlier, was still the, 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 the Defense Department was focused very much on the importance of Uzbekistan and particularly as Dick had mentioned as a logistics uh, transit um, uh, area. Uh, because of the geography and, need, and the need for expanding that, uh, protecting it. There were agreements that needed to be renewed and that meant dealing with the Uzbek government. And that also meant the decision at the end of the day was that of President Karimov. And it meant ensuring that President Karimov was in the correct position that he would uh, instruct the acceptance of these agreements and the like. And uh, it would be very difficult to do that if on the same hand, we have the other sort of great interest in, Washington, in the Washington bubble, if you will, of as John and Dick had mentioned of, if you will, the human rights uh, um, issues and, and the NGOs, Human Rights Watch and things of this nature. So when I was the DAS uh, and the Deputy Assistant Secretary, I'd have uh, General Petraeus on one phone about how important this is. And then I'd have Human Rights Watch on the other end, the State Department's Bureau of uh, Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. Uh, I, I actually had, um, was at the end of uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary, at the end of the Bush administration, and then Barack Obama was elected and a new administration came in. Uh, and I served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Central Asia under both. But at the end of the, uh, of the, of the Bush administration, uh, that was a very difficult issue uh, dealing with Uzbekistan because 
of the, uh, the, the fallout from the Andijan and the, as, if you will, vilification of President uh, Karimov and this effort of isolating Uzbekistan and its leadership, basically, and really focusing on if they want to have a relationship with us, they have to address these, uh, these human rights issues. Uh, so this was a very, it, it, there is a dilemma here that we had to deal with in order to how to build a relationship back uh, with President Karimov and the Uzbek government and, and still have to deal with all of the issues that we had, which I had, there were the religious freedom issues, the, the, the political prisoners. And then there was also there, this issue of forced child labor in the, uh, in the cotton fields, which is a major industry, of course, in, uh, in Uzbekistan. And, uh, and one that is deep and very, very complicated to deal with economically and socially and things of this nature. But there were quite adamant uh, advocates that Uzbekistan had to do all of these things uh, first before we would even talk to them. So I, this is kind of a setup. So when I, fortunately, when I got to Uzbekistan as ambassador, uh, Ambassador Norland had done a phenomenal job on the ground reestablishing this relationship. And as he has noted that through his own um, quiet diplomacy and particularly his, his dialogue with President Karimov, and I remember this quite clearly, that in letters that he wrote and things like that, that there were prisoners released and not just Sanjar Omar, but like you remember a few others. And it was really this effort because you had established certain trust with the president and with other members of the government who we were now starting to talk uh, talk with again, uh, there was some traction in this. It wasn't black and white, and, you know, the change of um, uh, dramatically, uh, and we all would get a lot of flack from uh, uh, certain quarters that were not being strong enough or were not uh, shaming and uh, publicly and things of this nature. But we understood as diplomats that in order we have to work with the government to get certain things done, and you have to have somewhat of a constructive relationship and dialogue. And I was able to build on Dick's work to expand this during the time that I was in Uzbekistan. And, uh, and so in order to expand not just the security relationship and getting the agreements that we needed to expand and continue the logistical uh, line through, through Uzbekistan, but also having more political dialogue, uh, more social dialogue. And even though many American NGOs had been sent out of the country, including the Peace Corps, and that was something that might come in time and has come subsequently and the like. But nevertheless, there was an openness to talk about these issues and see what could be done to set the scene for the eventual re-engagement on all these issues. And so I would say that on, on, on the political front, we even had the visit of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. There was a certain feeling in Uzbekistan with the Obama administration coming on for that this is a new administration, we could have a different relationship and one that isn't so bi binary, it's security or human rights and the like. And I think that President Obama's speech in Cairo uh, that he made early on was a very important signal to uh, Muslim populations around the world that the United States was going to be, would listen and be more open to discussion than being didactic and things. And I think we were, Dick, you may remember that, but I think it made quite an impression on President Karimov at the time too. So, uh, uh, and so, but Secretary Clinton visited uh, uh, Central Asia and visited Uzbekistan and had a meeting with President uh, Karimov I think the first Secretary of State, uh, you know, in quite a while, and and also we started having codels, small ones. There was Senator Lindsey Graham, um, Moran, who had been a representative from a long time from Northern Virginia, as well as um, uh, current Chairman of the uh, uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Representative Meeks uh, came, uh, and they would listen, and they would meet with Karimov and and listen to him. But I'd also meet. We would set up meetings with a variety of people from Uzbekistan because th this issue of trying to understand a country that has been portrayed in Washington and in the United States more as a caricature 
and not as the complicated, uh, sophisticated uh, country like all countries are and societies are. And they came away with an appreciation that this is a country with real people, with real politics uh, that you have to consider. And I think that this helped in the uh, enhanced relationship that we were able to construct. There was also the administration, the Obama administration pushing a new Silk Road policy of uh, focusing on interconnectivity, which was which Uzbekistan would have to play a critical role in because of its geography and its, its um, uh, infrastructure that it had. And it was building too. Uh, uh, there, Uzbekistan was building railroads, highways, these sorts of things throughout the period uh, uh, since independence. Uh, and also USAID was working more on economic issues of interconnectivity and also agricultural projects, which were phenomenally successful because of the, 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 the uh, experience that many Uzbeks had in high uh, end uh, products of vegetables, fruits, uh, berries, things of this nature, where a little bit of technology, a little bit of shared knowledge created a new, new very profitable industries of in produce and these sorts of things, which again, these small things, which then led to farmers to have cooperatives and then water sharing among them was very, it was a little, a very little money, very little investment and in really getting American agricultural farmers that are in the berry industry or pitted fruits and everything, meeting with Uzbek, sharing uh, their, um, their, um, uh, their, their experiences on even the use of bees and all these sorts of things. And the Uzbeks were, and, and the Uzbek government appreciated this and started giving more land, more efforts to try to, because they saw there was great potential in agriculture uh, in Uzbekistan and moving away from the cotton uh, monoculture that had, was their Soviet legacy. And similarly on another great issue on the human rights front, I think uh, of, of, on the Uzbek side is that they did grapple with the forced child labor. And by the time I left, they had invited the ILO, the International Labor Organization, which was one of the great demands that the human rights organizations were having. And they dealt constructively with the ILO and did manage by the time that I, uh, that I left, uh, virtually lim eliminate uh, forced child labor in the fields. It later, a, a, a concern on forced adult later, uh, uh, labor emerged, but on the matter that was the, the, the first in issue of child labor, that was being addressed and it was addressed again through quiet means of diplomacy, getting the right people together and the, and the initiative on the Uzbek side itself to, uh, to take this seriously because they saw, as we would explain to them, that it just made their image that much difficult uh, to improve in the United States and in Europe and in the business community uh, if they didn't address this, this issue, which was something of, a, of, a, of an international issue. So um, we also were able to increase uh, our extent of English language training, much because the Uzbek government saw it, this was in their interest to do it and opened up doors and things of this nature. Uh, we had General Motors opened a powertrain factory in uh, Tashkent, which was an important investment of GM. I, I don't know if it's still operating as it was at the time because of the economic downturns that, that has occurred globally. Uh, but there were these issues opening up at the time. And I was able to travel throughout the country. I was able, before I got to uh, Uzbekistan, to learn a little Uzbek and enjoyed trying to speak the language. And that had a great effect on people to show that I respect their, their, their culture, their language, and enjoy it, and would go throughout just to meet and listen to people and hear what they had to say. And I think that they were greatly throughout all the Kishlaks, that not just Samarkand and Bukhara, but out in the, in the areas that most people wouldn't visit, that an American, and no, not just myself, but others of our embassy were allowed to be able to go out and just listen and talk to people and see what they're doing on agricultural projects and things of this nature. Uh, so when we left, uh, when I left, uh, I think we had a, um, um, a relationship that was growing, was expanding. Uh, I was able to enjoy, I think, a, a constructive relationship with President Karimov. Um, 
which was which was very important. And I would listen to him and and could understand his point of view uh, of where he was coming from. But also I'd listen to all other Uzbeks as well in order to absorb in my own mind how this very complicated place operates. Uh, it is a fascinating uh, experience. Um, uh, and I went up to Kazakhstan uh, afterwards. I know my Uzbek friends were saying, why would you want to leave it up there? But that's another story. Uh, I do what I'm told, as I told President Karimov when he was saying, why are you leaving? Our, you don't like our food? You don't like, I said, no, no, no. I love it. He says, you know, they eat something different up there. It's, it's cold. And I said, yes, I know. But as you know, as a president, I salute and say, my president says, you must be ambassador. Appoint you here, I go, regardless of the temperature, food, whatever. Uh, I, of course, enjoyed Kazakhstan quite a bit. I'm glad to see Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are engaging quite a lot in, in the region itself. Uh, because as the DAS Deputy Assistant Secretary, I also dealt with Kazakhstan a lot. And I had also been working, as you had mentioned, with the, as a, the special assistant to Ambassador Collins when he was the, um, the, uh, advise, the, the ambassador at large for the former Soviet Union. Uh, and, uh, and John was his deputy at the time and uh, traveling out to Central Asia and meeting Joe Pressel and, and, and also Stan Escudero, Henry Clark. In those early days, I was there and saw what was being done. So it's an interesting for me personally and professionally to see the, 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 the progression of, of our relationship over these 30 years. Um, since I happen to have been in the Soviet Union in Leningrad 30 years ago when it all collapsed and, uh, uh, and like to. So it, it, it is, it was, Uzbekistan is as everyone who served there, Dick, John, uh, Joe, Henry and Stan, a, a phenomenal country, fascinating with history, uh, and culture and a people who are absolutely fascinating and interesting in and of themselves that deserve, I think, more attention than the stereotype that has been ascribed to them. Um, so anyways, uh, I will conclude my spiel on that. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Kroll. And actually you ended on the perfect note because you segue exactly into the first question that I wanted to ask you and Ambassador Herbst, which was about your time working with Ambassador Collins. You had both been out to the region with him in the 90s and obviously had seen Uzbekistan in the early years. So when you later are out there as ambassadors, what were the significant changes that each of you noted? I'll start with Ambassador Herbst and then go to Ambassador Kroll. I have to um, apologize because unfortunately, while I was working with Jim Collins, um, I did not make it to Uzbekistan. I was, I was on uh, one of his earlier trips that took place in, um, I'm trying to remember, it has been like, October of 2000, excuse me, of 1994. I just arrived um, in his office in his second year. Uh, and we started off in Almaty. But while we were there, the word came that in fact, uh, President Clinton was gonna receive the president of Ukraine, Kuchma, um, in early November. So Jim dis dispatched me back home from Almaty, and I did not get to get, I did not get to Tashkent on that trip. But obviously I was following the country closely from Washington. I met senior Uzbeks as they came through Washington. Um, but I'm not really in a position to say how much things changed between say 1994 and 2000 when I arrived. That's fair. And I have, I'm very sorry that you were deprived of that visit to Tashkent. <laughs> Blame Ukraine me, me for too. that. <laughs> Ambassador Kroll, your turn. Well, uh, I did travel throughout Central Asia with, um, uh, with Ambassador Collins and uh, courtesy of the Department of Defense. Um, at, at the time, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Policy was Ashton Carter, later became Secretary of Defense. But the fact of the matter is we knew in those days, uh, the State Department doesn't have an air arm, the Pentagon does. Uh, it was always good to be able to uh, hitch a ride on uh, Ash Carter's plane. And his um, uh, deputy assistant secretary of state was uh, 
Liz Sherwood, now Liz Sherwood Randall, and I noticed that she, she, she was figured in the pictures that she went to the conference that I think, John, you were at uh, most recently in Tosh Kent. And I, I know, I, I believe she had her honeymoon in, uh, in, in, in Uzbekistan because she was so enthralled with the con country on these visits, I remember. And, uh, and I'm sure that the, the, the Uzbeks uh, rolled out the red carpet for her. So it was kind of a homecoming for her, I imagine when she, she, she went back in a couple of weeks ago. But one thing about with Ambassador Collins, I learned from him throughout, with, which was useful my career as an ambassador and as a deputy assistant secretary. And what he did and what he focused on was what he called tending the garden. Uh, our diplomacy requires tending the garden. You just can't have it sporadic. I think uh, uh, it was Joe Pressel previously said that the United States somehow says, here's a problem, this is a case, we go in, we have to solve it, uh, period. Uh, no, you have to develop a relationship. You have to be able to know who the players are and that takes time and that takes effort and that takes being there. And so, and, and going out there, not because there's something you need or you want, what you need and you want is a relationship and you have to tend it by just being there and being able to listen what's on your agenda, what's on, on our agenda and to maintain that contact. And I know we as ambassadors in the field, that's our, our bread, that's our stock in trade is to maintain that development relationships and our embassies and getting, getting people out of the embassies to expand the network of people that we know and, and understand what's going on there. So, um, that was vitally important. Uh, but that period when, when Jim Collins was there was that initial period of developing relationships and dealing with very difficult issues as these countries were emerging from the Soviet Union and finding themselves as independent states. And you know, John recollects because he had to deal with all of the countries that, that emerged with the exception of the Baltic Republics in our, in our little bureau of, of the new independent states all real, realizing they're all different. It's just like they're all the stands thrown together or the Caucasus or, or Ukraine or Belarus. They're all very different and the like as well. And this came out years later that Uzbekistan is different from Kazakhstan. You have to understand it. And over the period of, I brought back Ambassador Collins and Joe Pressel to uh, Tashkent when we were celebrating 25 years of diplomatic relations five years ago when I was ambassador. So it was interesting to hear their impressions and also from the Uzbeks that had served in the United States and people like current foreign minister Kamilov who's been on the scene for quite a while. So I think learning is it, through this period, we have gone through a lot together, ups and downs, but one hopes that throughout understanding the respect and the respect that the United States always has had for the independent sovereignty of Uzbekistan and all these countries, that that was something that has always been important to these countries and to the United States. And knowing it's hard dealing with the United States often as, as, as a country because of the demands and the way we look at, 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 at them and what they need to do for us, and a little less when it's, what can we do for them? So uh, uh, I would say that uh, there's been uh, certainly a change, but I'm glad to see that that openness, that feeling and respect that we have towards each other is something that has only, I believe, grown over time. And I'm glad to see uh, uh, that, that development. So to your comment about tending the garden and having these relationships and developing that trust, I guess my question for Ambassador Norland, you know, you were very much entrusted with rebuilding the relationship. Who did you find to be the most effective interlocutors in rebuilding the relationship and getting things back on track after some of the, the, the leaner years in our engagement with Uzbekistan? I think the most important interlocutor was President Karimov um, because uh, he set the tone and uh, the direction and uh, anybody further down the chain uh, would take their cue from how the president uh, viewed the American ambassador. And, uh, and like George says, I found that you could have a real discussion with him. There, there were real issues. He had, he had his own point of view. I, 
after being in Uzbekistan, I started to develop the concept of, it's not my concept, but the idea of political culture and how it differs from one country to another. And, and he embodied a particular political culture that we needed to recognize and understand. Um, and I think, you know, as George intimated, by, by taking him seriously and, and being respectful, I think we were able to convince him that, uh, you know, the United States was not trying to play gotcha. Uh, uh, we, we did have some interests in common and we could start to rebuild the relationship. And uh, as he kind of took that on board, you know, as soon as you got one headline in, in the paper there with a picture of you and the president, everybody else down the line took their cue and understood, okay, it's all right to see the American ambassador. And then we, we had a little more access. Um, it was all still very regimented. Uh, you know, I remember when we would try to travel to, to uh, the, the provincial capitals, uh, the, or, you know, the, 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 head, the seats of government of the different, I forget now even what they're called, but uh, the wilayats or something. Um, and, you know, if we arrived 20 minutes early, the authorities wanted us to wait you know, by in the car, by the door, you know, you can't get out, you can't go for a walk uh, because there was this, you know, you, you, it had to be done a certain way or, or there would be dire consequences. But the more that we were able to engage uh, with the president and set a tone of, of respectful engagement, um, uh, the, the more it was possible to, to get out and about and engage with people. And, um, and there were, you know, some very serious officials uh, who we dealt with on on, in a very constructive way. And, you know, uh, Minister Kamilov was, I think, ambassador to Washington when I was in Tashkent. Uh, we would have constructive dialogues when we would run into each other. And, it, you know, the fact that he's the foreign minister again now uh, is a tribute to his stamina and, and patriotism. And, you know, you talk about one of the wise men of the region who can really help uh, implement a vision for the future that benefits everybody. I, I put him in that category. So I, I guess I'd describe it that way. It began at the top and, um, and then filtered down. Thank you. Ambassador Herbst, you mentioned that in your first year, you had one visit, but in the second year, the Codels took off. Why all of a sudden interest, aside from 9-11? Who was coming to visit? What were they interested in Uzbekistan for at that point? It was all about Uzbekistan, all about 9-11. Um, and some of the senators um, and Congress folk came, you might say on their own, meaning that they, they realized this was an important country and with that was that point our principal foreign policy operation. Others were encouraged to come by um, President Bush, by Secretary Rumsfeld, by Secretary Powell. Uh, because I heard, I heard that from the senators themselves when they landed. And so they would come, they'd see President Karimov, they'd probably see the defense and the foreign ministers and the foreign minister then was Kamilov. Um, the defense minister then was um, Guliyama, a very capable guy. And um, sometimes they would also, oh, actually they would usually go to the base we'd established at Karshi Khanabad. Um, and with, some, with a couple of the visits, they also would go to either Samarkand or Bukhara or both. Uh, but the, the, base, the basic reason they came was again, this was now the pivotal front in American foreign policy, and they didn't know much about this area. And so the, their coming was a very good thing because it, it um, opened up Uzbekistan to very influential Americans. And you know, the, the Foreign Service has a love-hate relationship with Congress, which I think frankly is, is not smart. Um, a hate relationship because they don't like the, the requirements that Congress levies. And sometimes there's a certain um, disdain because they feel they're not as well as formed as we diplomats. The love, of course, is because the State Department depends on Congress. So I welcomed every single congressional visit. I saw it as a chance to, to sell them my point of view. And I think that's the only way that we diplomats um, should deal with our Congress. On the topic of Afghanistan, we have a question from the audience about the six plus three proposal. You know, this was a format that Uzbekistan had proposed to address issues related to Afghanistan. Um, the question is, why did it not get more support from the United States? Why were we not more supportive of the Uzbek proposal for the six plus three format? 
Um, so I would open that up to anyone who would like to take that question on. Ambassador Kroll, to you. Right. I, 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 I was, uh, I've been, I was aware of this um, uh, versions of this proposal and the like, but I, I think it really goes to uh, an issue of American foreign policy and diplomacy, which generally, if it isn't something that is uh, brought up or thought of in Washington, it tends not to get a lot of attention. Uh, I, it, it's something where. Uh, if we thought of it and wanted to promote it, uh, that would have that, of course, would be something we would all be working on. But it, it, if it comes from someone else, it, it, it there it has to be an issue of okay, well, what do we think and do about it and the like. So I, th there's a certain inhibition when something comes from <laughs> from the outside coming into Washington. I know my colleagues have experience in that too, but um, there tends to be from the Washington side. We know, we think, we have, it's our initiatives and things like that, but taking other initiatives and pushing them uh, and the like. But I think the United States had been often, I would say, with Afghanistan, trying to include Afghanistan in the Central Asia sort of framework with, for instance, the trade and, uh, uh, trade and investment framework agreement and the like. But there was always, at the time, pushback from the Central Asian countries that saying, well, this is really for us. Afghanistan is an entirely different case altogether. And they don't really fit in with us. And I'd say even perhaps from the Afghans, there was a, looking across the border, these are, this is a different culture, different world altogether, different economies. And as Dick said, the political culture is very different across, as it is among the Central Asians themselves. So it's hard getting the Central Asian, the five, former Soviet republics working together because they have their own differences and, 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 and somewhat hostilities, animosities, and things like that, including Afghanistan is, 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 brings in another element that has been very hard, oh, even when the United States has proposed it, to uh, get others on board. But I believe now, and I guess the next panel may talk about that, there is, with the, the uh, President Mirzioyev and the government of trying to bring Afghanistan into more into the Central Asia um, um, equation. You know, this is actually jogging uh, my memory a little bit too. Um, and, and just one point I'd make on the six plus three, I think the basic idea was that you would take Afghanistan's neighbors and try to get them to work together to uh, shut down the factors that were contributing to violence in Afghanistan, whether it was the Taliban coming from Pakistan or, or what have you. And, and I think what, you know, the, the problem with the concept was that you had countries uh, kind of saying the right things, but doing things that were completely different, you know, whether it was Iran, uh, you know, Russia. Uh, I mean, I don't even remember who all was exactly in the six plus three, but if you didn't really have a genuine commitment to use your influence to shut down the factors that were stoking the conflict, it, it wasn't we're going to really do any good. And, and I, you know, I think uh, Minister Kamilov was one of those who really tried to activate the six plus three and uh, shared, you know, we all shared the frustration that it wasn't really generating anything. Um, and as George says, too, it, it, you know, it wasn't our idea. We were never completely vested in it. I did notice later on that we embraced uh, something I guess called the C5 plus one or something like that. And, and that to me was, you know, was a, a hopeful construct, but, you know, aimed more at trying to bring Afghanistan into the, uh, into the, the broader Central Asian fold rather than trying to specifically focus on the, the violence in Afghanistan itself. Something of a follow-on question. Uh, someone in the audience has asked about this new forum that was proposed two weeks ago at the international conference that was held in Tashkent, uh, that there's now a new regional platform that will consist of Uzbekistan, the United States in conjunction with Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, if anyone would like to express any position or comment on the effectiveness of this new platform. I know Ambassador Herbst, you were at that conference, but I think this announcement came post-conference. 
Right. Um, that, I wasn't aware of that being discussed in any real way um, during the conference. Uh, I don't see any objections to it. Um, but I, I am not enthusiastic about the prospects because I think that Pakistan has a very clear interest in ensuring the victory of the Taliban. Uh, so uh, you give it a shot, but again, I'm, I'm not an optimist on this one. During your remarks, Ambassador Norland, you had mentioned that, you know, at various points in U.S. foreign policy, we've shifted our views. And at one time we had, during the Obama administration, the pivot to Asia. And now we're refocusing back towards China, Asia. How do you, any of you see this impacting how we look at Central Asia? Are we going to view it through an Indo-Pacific, really more Indo lens because of China? Or are we still looking at Central Asia through an Afghanistan lens at this point? I mean, I'll, I'll let somebody who's got a more contemporary view jump in, but uh, I can. I would just say that, um, you know, uh, one of the new factors here might be India and its role uh, as really kind of a, a major uh, balancing factor in, in Indo-Pacific uh, relations. And, you know, India uh, does start to touch on Central Asia. Uh, and, and so I, I think that there are shifting dynamics uh, in that region. I, I just go back to my basic point that I, I think a, a rounded policy on China should take uh, much more note of the role that Central Asia and South Central Asia can play in, um, in, in, that, in, in balancing things off and, and avoiding you know, uh, uh, disastrous outcomes. Um, I think we've started to pay more attention to India, but I, I wonder why we wouldn't pay more attention to Central Asia in the same vein. Ambassador Kroll? Right, Brian, I would, I would note uh, that one issue of, with Central Asia is how it's dealt with in the U.S. government uh, and in the State Department. Now, when John was ambassador uh, to Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan was part of the European Eurasian. Bureau. Um, and that was subsequently changed by the time uh, Dick Norland became uh, ambassador, where it was taken out of the Central Asian, the five Central Asian states were taken out of the European Bureau uh, and placed in the South and Central Asia Bureau. Uh, and I, I know number, I wasn't in the region at the time, I was ambassador in Belarus, but I remember seeing uh, cables that I think are ambassadors in, the, in, in those countries were not very, they, they were not in favor of that because of the issue of how different Central Asia is from South Asia. Uh, and, uh, and it's not part of the Asia Bureau. So when policies are made in the, and when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the South and Central Asia Bureau, um, I could see that there were policies made about like reaction to Russia, which is a big player, or reaction to China, which is a big player, now a big player in Central Asia, that in the bureaus in the State Department, but even in the, in the White House at the security, in the National Security Council, where Central Asia doesn't figure in unless it, it, when it was in, when it's in the South and Central Asia Bureau or in the directorate, uh, as it was in the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the previous administration uh, with uh, South Asia, the focus was then on, on, on Afghanistan. Or and then when issues were made about policies made about Russia, what ha what the effects were in Central Asia didn't matter. It, they weren't put in people's minds. And similarly, uh, in the policy toward China, there really wasn't an effort of because they're not in that bureau. They're not there at the table when these things are discussed. So I found when I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary, I'd spend a lot of time with these other bureaus to find out what they're doing, what they're up to from the point of view of how this can affect our relations with Central Asia. So uh, uh, I would also, I know you had an earlier que question to the earlier panel about China. And uh, when I was there and when I was the DAS, there there really wasn't much of, an, of a problem with China. Uh, China was even viewed as something, at least in Washington, as you know, a possible the, the Belt and Road Initiative was saying, oh, this is part could be part of the new Silk Road, you know, East West, because it was basically diversification 
And I would suspect that one of the reasons of putting Central Asia into South Asia in the Bush administration of um, George W. Bush was basically to try to pull Central Asia away from the Russia orbit and to try to develop a connectivity with South Asia, although you have the problem of Afghanistan physically and, and politically and, and security uh, between the two. So there hasn't been an overall conceptualization, even though there have been many strategies about Central Asia that the US government has, 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 uh, in, has put up or discussed and published and things of this nature, but it still is caught between these tectonic plates of uh, the Russia policy, the China policy, and then the Afghan policy, uh, and then with you know, the Indo, uh, the India policy too. So it, this is what makes Central Asia uh, complicated uh, from a policy point because it, it, it impinges on all these, these, these areas which are dealt with rather separately in some respects by the United States. We have time for one last question, and I think this will actually go to Ambassador Herbst. Um, we have a question from the audience from someone who recalls the Peace Corps volunteers in the early 2000s, um, but also recalls the fact that there was a lot of criticism about them being potentially CIA agents and how that really impacted the relationship that Peace Corps volunteers were able to have with locals. Um, is there any potential to bring back the, the Peace Corps program, do you think, to Uzbekistan? I, th I think that given the clear opening of Uzbek society under President Mirziyoyev's leadership, um, this is something that uh, is, is possible, maybe even likely if, if in fact Washington wanted it. Uh, I would obviously think, uh, I think obviously that's a great idea. But as for as for the alleged, you know, the charges of Peace Corps being CIA back in my day, um, I suspect that was probably a Russian black op. But it's also true that there would have been some people in the Uzbek security services who might also not want Americans running around Uzbekistan and seeing what they would see. Thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists. Unfortunately, we are out of time for this session, but I extend my sincere thanks to Ambassador John Herbst, <clears throat> Ambassador Richard Norland, and Ambassador George Kroll for their remarks today on the U.S.-Uzbek relationship in the 2000s. We're going to take a quick 15-minute break and reconvene at 11.30 a.m. Washington, D.C. time for our final session on opportunities for the U.S.-Uzbekistan relationship in a new era of cooperation. Uh, the webinar will close out at this point, but all you have to do is click the link to reconnect for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>